You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. ask you a probing question this morning. What comes into your mind when you think about God? What comes into your mind when you think about God? A.W. Tozer has said that if you could exact an accurate and truthful answer to that question from any man, you could determine with certainty the future, the spiritual future of that man. What comes into your mind when you think about God? Because the truth of the matter is that you and I will become just like the God that we worship. And we will move toward the God that we worship. If your thoughts about God are below Him, if they are base, if they are debauched, if they are low, then you will inevitably gravitate toward that God that you worship. And your conduct and your thinking and your theology will become debased and debauched and low. But if, on the other hand, your thoughts about God are magnificent and high and glorious and exalted and worthy of Him, then your conduct and your thoughts and your theology will be high and exalted and worthy of Him. A.W. Tozer calls this the secret law of the soul, that we move toward that which we worship. That is true, is it not? We move toward that which we worship. That was the truth that was expressed in Psalm 115 that we read today. After talking about the idols who have hands but cannot feel, feet that cannot walk, eyes but they cannot see, and ears but they cannot hear, the psalmist says, everyone who makes them becomes like them. You become just like the God that you worship. And so I ask you this question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? Thoughts that are worthy of Him? Or thoughts that are far below what He actually is? What do you think about? Now your knee-jerk Christian response is to do this. It is to say, Jim, I only think high thoughts of God. I never think anything about God that is not true of Him. And so my picture of God in my mind that we just got done worshiping is God as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. Now I ask you this question because you don't have to bow down before a piece of wood or before a piece of metal or before a graven image to be guilty of idolatry. The reality is that you can come here on a Sunday morning and sing all of these songs and worship and listen to the Scripture reading and listen to the preaching of the Word and serve the Lord and leave here and be an idolater. How is that possible? Because idolatry is not the act of bowing down physically before an idol. Idolatry is a sin of the mind and of the heart. That's what idolatry is. Let me give you a passage of Scripture that you're already familiar with. Romans chapter 1. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes how people devolve into idolatry. Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God nor give thanks, but they became futile in their what? Their speculations. They became empty in their thoughts. Futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God for an image made like man, four-footed beasts, creeping things, and birds. Uh, It started in the mind. They did not honor God as God, but they became empty in their thoughts, and then they exchanged the glory of God for an image made like corruptible man. But where did it begin? Where does idolatry begin? Does idolatry begin when we form an idol? When we carve a piece of wood and overlay it with gold? Is that when idolatry begins? No. Idolatry begins in the mind. You know what idolatry is? Idolatry is assuming something about God and then acting as if it's true. That's idolatry. And an idol of the mind is just as offensive to God as an idol of the hand. Gets that? Your false concept of who God is This idea of who God is that you have pictured in your mind, if it is not an accurate reflection of who God is as He has revealed Himself in Scripture, then you worship an idol. 
Whatever else may be true of you, however much you may read the Scriptures and however much you may sing Christian songs and say nice things about God and even believe on Christ for salvation, if the God that you worship has been fashioned in your mind after your own likeness, you are an idolater. Even though you may never physically bow down and worship an image. Because idolatry is a sin of the heart and it starts in the mind. It is assuming something is true of God and then acting as if it is. You know what the horrendous part about idolatry is? It is libel on God's character. It's libel on God's character. It is saying this is true of God when it is not. Because the idolater not only slanders God's character by saying things are true about Him that are not true about Him, but he goes one step further. Idolatry is offensive because it takes the one true God who is worthy of all of our adoration and all of our praise and all of our thanksgiving and all of our service and all of our life and it sets Him aside and it puts in His place something we fashion in our minds and worship in our hearts. And it's libel on His character. It is saying to God, you're not worthy of my worship. This is worthy of my worship. I will bow down and I will give homage to my concept of God that is between my ears, the one that I have made in my mind and in my heart, fashioned after my own likeness. And here's the marvelous, wonderful, almost mind-boggling thing about idols. You look at any idol that you and I might worship, and it will bear a striking resemblance to the worshiper. You ever notice that? When they make idols, what do the idols have? Hands, feet, ears. And they have spiritual and emotional and mental characteristics that are much like the people that bow down and worship them. Psalm 115. Everyone who worships them becomes like them. Everybody who trusts in the idol becomes like the idol. Because we tend to fashion an idol after our own thinking, after our own mind. C.H. Spurgeon said this, Man is such an idolater that if he cannot idolize anything else, he will idolize himself and he will set himself up and bow down and worship himself. That's what idolatry is, it's self-worship. We take something that's much like us, it's not us, but it's much like us, and we set it up and we bow down to it. And we end up worshiping ourselves by proxy. That's what's so offensive about idolatry. And where does it begin? It begins in the mind. It begins by thinking wrong thoughts about God and acting as if those thoughts are true. And so I ask you, what comes into your mind when you think about God? Have you created a God that's fashioned after your own liking? In Acts chapter 17 in the city of Athens, there were two types of idols present. And you'll need your Bibles open to the book of Acts chapter 17. There were two types of idols present. There were idols of the hand that had been fashioned by the men and the women in the city. Uh, Paul walked into Athens and he saw a city that was smothered with idols. Idols all over the place. Easier to find an idol in Athens than it was to find a man, it was said. Idols of the hand, carvings, engravings, and statues, and shrines, and temples, and all of these things that the people bowed down to. But then there were also idols of the mind in Athens. These were the idols that were worshipped by the Epicurean and the Stoics. Because the intellectual elites of the Areopagus would never have bowed down and worshipped before a piece of wood or a piece of metal. They were too good for that. Instead, they had fashioned in their minds who they thought God was. For the Epicureans, it was some small, weak, distant, insipid God who had nothing to do with the affairs of men, nothing to do with creation, nothing to do with judgment, nothing to do with sustaining His creation. If God existed in the mind of the Epicurean and the Stoic, He was a far-off, distant God and had nothing to do with you and I. We could not count on Him to create anything, to sustain anything, or to judge anything. And so in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul, in preaching this message before the Areopagus, is attempting to lift the eyes of his audience off of their idols of the hand and their idols of the mind to the one true God as He has revealed Himself in the pages of Holy Scripture. Now last week we got halfway through the second point of Paul's sermon and we're going to continue with that. And I want you to look at verse 22 and we'll read it and catch its context one more time. And then we'll continue with where we left off last week. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, 
to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are His children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought the reference to the mind or the speculation or device of man. Verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising Him from the dead. A couple weeks ago, we looked at how God is the creator of all things. Last week, we started looking at how God is the sustainer of all things. And the Apostle Paul is wanting to lift their eyes off of their idols and onto the one true God who created the world and everything in it. And then he sustains the world and everything in it. Far from being a God who needs our supply, he is the God who supplies all of our need. And none of our service and none of our existence and nothing that we can do can contribute anything to His person. This is the the God that Paul is proclaiming to them. And we got halfway through this idea that God is the sustainer of all things. And we finished at the end of verse 26 where Paul says that God has determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Verse 27, 28, and 29 continues with this thought of God being the sustainer of all things, and Paul points out to them two things. First of all, man's responsibility to God, and second, man's rejection of God. Now you'll notice that up until verse 26, and through the end of verse 26, you're hard-pressed to put your finger on anything that the Apostle Paul might be saying, which might sound like he's calling them sinners. Do you notice that? No mention of sin, no mention of the cross, and you start to wonder, Paul, when are you going to get to the good stuff? When are you going to get to the fact that these people are sinners? That's, that's today's message. God is the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. And as sustainer of all things, God demands certain things of us, and we are responsible to God for certain things. Look at verse 27. What are we responsible for him, to Him for? That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He's not far from each one of us. What are we responsible to do? Seek God. Simple. He has appointed the boundaries of our habitation. He has appointed our times and our seasons, when we live, when we die, when nations rise, when nations fall, in order that we might what? Seek Him. You and I should be able to look out at all of creation and say to ourselves, this we live among in one large effect. If we live amongst in an effect like this, then there must be a cause. And so we might trace back to the cause and say there is a certain cause that caused this effect. And we are responsible to seek after the uncaused cause. God holds us responsible for that. We are responsible to look at creation and say the invisible attributes of a creator are evident everywhere around us. In the trees, in the vast expanse of the universe, in the stars and the sun, in the exchange of plants and animals and human beings, in my own body I can see evidence of intelligent design. I am responsible to seek after that uncaused cause. I ought to be able to look at my own conscience, which bears witness to me day after day, either accusing me or excusing me, because the law of God is written on my hearts, and men, whether they know Christ or not, whether they know Christ or not, instinctively do the law. They know when they've done wrong. And guilt presses in upon us. And our conscience tells us that there must be a moral law giver who is placed within each side of us this conscience that bears witness to the moral law. And we are responsible to seek the uncaused cause and that moral law giver. 
And men ought to look at creation and see the care with which God cares for His creation. That the sun and the rain and the ground bring forth seed for the sower and bread for the eater. That God cares for a creation that has been in rebellion to Him for 6,000 years. And we ought to look at the creation, at our conscience, and at the care with which God nurtures us. And it ought to lead us to repentance so that we would seek Him. But does it? Does any man seek after God? Romans chapter 3 tells us what? No man seeks after God. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. And Jesus said men will not come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be exposed. If I come before a holy God and I pursue after the light, it's going to expose all of the rottenness in my soul and my spirit and my deadness in my sin. And I don't want that exposed. And I love darkness rather than light. And Jesus said, men will not come to the light. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There are none who understand. There is none who seeks for God. Man is responsible to seek after God, but does he? I had a hunter's education class when I was in a teenager before they gave me a gun. They make you take a class, which I figure is probably a good idea for everybody else but me. I could have handled the gun without the class, but they made me take the class and before they would give me a license to carry a firearm. And I remember in the hunter's education class that um, it was toward the end of that week of classes, there was a video that they showed us when we were talking about survival. And the video chronicled the effects of hypothermia. And they were describing what hypothermia does to you after you've been exposed to the cold for a period of time. And I I remember very little else about the class, but I do remember this one particular video. And it showed this man who had got lost out in the woods and he was walking through the snow getting colder and colder and it was raining and he would try and start a fire and he was shaking. And over the course of time he started to get whiter and, and bluer and sicker and colder. And toward the end of his lostness, he was wandering around the woods, and I remember this one particular scene. He was standing by a skid trail, and there were some trees along the skid trail, and he was hiding behind the tree as snowmobilers were racing by on snowmobiles. Why was he doing that? They said because in the final stages of hypothermia, it so affects your mind that you actually run from the things that can save you, and you actually do things to hasten your death. Because you get so disoriented and so messed up mentally that you start taking off your clothing because you think you're hot. You get disoriented. You'll, you'll keep away from people so that nobody finds you. You get paranoid. This guy ended up running from the very thing that could save us. It's the same way with man and his sin. The one thing that can save us, a holy, righteous, gracious, loving God, is the one thing that sinful man runs away from. Does any man seek after God? Yet we're responsible to but men do not. You say, well, I did. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You know, this is the fundamental flaw with the whole seeker-sensitive movement that's going on in our country right now. The fundamental flaw is this. There's no such thing as a seeker. Men don't seek after God. Now, that's not to say that man is not religious. Oh, man's very religious. He seeks after a God that he makes in his mind. He seeks after a God who can appease his guilt He seeks after a God who's fashioned just like him, thinks the same way he does, likes the same things he likes, won't confront him in his sin. Men seek after all kinds of gods. But does man seek after the one, holy, true, infinite, righteous, sovereign, ruler, and creator, sustainer, and judge of all the universe? Does man seek after him? Does man seek after God as he's revealed in the pages of Scripture? Paul says no. Not one. They say, I sought God. But Jesus said, if you came to the Lord, if you end up coming to the light, it's not because you sought God, it's because God sought you. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You didn't seek him. He sought you and drew you to himself. No man seeks after God. Yet that's what we are responsible to do. To seek for him and to grope after him if we might find him, the Apostle Paul says, because he is not far from each one of us. God is not far from each one of us. Look at the text. In his message, verse 27, we are to grope for him and find him, and he's not far from each one of us. God is not distant. 
He hasn't hidden himself somewhere out in creation playing this game of cosmic hide and seek holding us responsible to find him. He's very near to us. We can look at creation and say there is a God. He must be infinite. He must be a creator. He must be intelligent. He must be powerful. And we can see the invisible hand of God all over creation. He's not far from us. The Epicureans said no, God is very distant. He has nothing to do with this world. If he has existed at all, it's simply far distant from us as he observes what happens here, but he'll never interfere with us. Scripture says the exact opposite. Jeremiah 23, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God who is far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? Psalm 145, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He's very near to us. If men would just reach out and grope for Him. But do men do that? Never. Never. We don't seek after God, but that's the one thing that God holds us responsible to do. But men will not come to the light. And He's very near to each one of us. Then look what the Apostle Paul says in verse 28. In Him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Now, verse 28, I want you to notice two things closely. The beginning of verse 28 is a quotation from a a pagan poet. The phrase, in him we live and move and exist, is a quotation from a pagan poet. Then Paul says, as even some of your own poets have said, the end of verse 28 is another quotation from another pagan poet. Verse 28, for we also are his children. So Paul quotes two different poets, Two different poems, both of them pagans. Now let me give you the quotations. The first first quotation was from a man named Epimenides. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If you're a philosopher, you know his name. I'm neither a philosopher nor a theologian, so I'm a little uh, at want to pronounce his name right. Epimenides. And he wrote an ode to Zeus. Now, Epimenides was a Cretan. From the island of Crete, by nature a Cretan and a poet and a philosopher, lived about 600 years before Christ. And the Cretans believed that Zeus had died, that he was a mortal being and he had died. So they fashioned a tomb for Zeus. And they made a tomb for Zeus. Epimenides did not like this, and so he wrote a poem extolling the virtues of the immortal Zeus. He didn't believe Zeus could die. And in his poem, this is what he writes, They fashioned a tomb for thee, O holy and high one. The Cretans... Always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. But thou art not dead, thou livest and abidest forever, for in thee we live and move and have our being. An ode to Zeus. Now you'll notice probably two lines in there that sound familiar. Did you notice the first one? Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. Now Paul quotes that in Titus chapter 1 verse 12, reminding Titus who was ministering in the island of Crete, Cretans are liars. Even one of their own poets says they're all liars. And here he quotes the same poet from the same uh, poem again, but this time he is he is explaining the... uh, um, Well, I'll get into this in a second. This time he's quoting the part that has to do with an ode to Zeus. Cretans are liars. They say you have died, Zeus, but you haven't. In you we live and exist and have our being. This psalm of worship, this ode of praise to the god Zeus. The second poet that he quotes is Eratus. Eratus lived in 300 B.C. He was a con- not a contemporary, a countryman of Paul from the same area that Paul was from. He was a Stoic philosopher, a Stoic poet. Paul would have been familiar with his writings because much like you and I might be familiar with the writings of, of locals like Pat McManus, uh, Paul was, would have been uh, familiar with the writings of Eratus because he was from the same area and region that Paul was from. Eratus writes this, in another ode to Zeus, Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken, for every street and every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we indeed are his offspring. That's what Paul quotes at the end of verse 28. Now at this juncture, you're probably saying to yourself, I have a sticky question for you, Jim. What is the Apostle Paul doing quoting pagan poets to prove his point? Couldn't he have quoted from the Old Testament? Certainly he could. And so people ask the question, 
Is Paul here saying that the Zeus that they worshipped and the God that he worshipped were one and the same? Much like ignorant people today will say, the God of Mohammed and the God of Christians, it's all the same God. Is that what Paul's driving at? Is Paul lending credibility to Zeus worship? Is he lending credibility to the people who wrote these odes to Zeus? What's he doing? You want to know what he's doing? He is quoting an authority that they would have been familiar with. And he could have quoted from the Old Testament. He could have said, it says in the Jewish Scriptures that, and he could have quoted any one of the prophets, probably from memory. But he doesn't do that. They wouldn't have understood Jewish Scriptures. They wouldn't have been familiar with that. They wouldn't have known what he was talking about. And they didn't recognize it as authoritative. The Apostle Paul is saying, God is near to us. He holds us responsible to reach out and to seek Him and to grope for Him. And we can see His invisible attributes in all of creation. And then to back up that assertion, he quotes these two pagan poets, as even some of your own poets have stumbled across this truth. Now, they wrongly attributed these things to Zeus. But these things that were true, that the poets recognized from creation, those attributes belong not to Zeus, but to this unknown God that Paul is proclaiming. Even your own poets have recognized true things about the Creator of the universe from creation, Paul says. But they attributed them to Zeus. Paul saying, these things are true, but not of Zeus. They are true of the God that I am proclaiming to you. I mentioned last week how I was invited into a public school system in Canada, public school in Canada, to teach on creationism for two hours. And when I went in there, I, I did something that I think was strategic. I didn't quote any creationists for those two hours. All I quoted was evolutionists. Now, when it came to defining what a creationist believes, I would quote a creationist because I wanted to accurately represent what the creationist believes. But when it came to refuting evolution or to building my case for creation, I didn't quote creationists. I quoted evolutionists. I quoted evolutionary scientists on the lack of fossil evidence, on the fact that their theory goes right in the face of all the established laws of science and the lack of evidence for it. I didn't quote any creationists at all. I could have quoted Dwayne Gish or John Morris. I, I had a list of people I could have quoted, but I didn't. I quoted evolutionists. Why would I do such a thing? Because if they came up to me after or during class and said, I don't agree with this point, I could honestly say, I haven't misrepresented what you believe. I've quoted your people about your theory and the lack of evidence. How are you going to argue against that? That's what Paul's doing. The pagan poets had stumbled across truth. We are all created by God. Eratus knew that. God is very near to us. Epimenides knew that. And Paul's saying, even your own poets understand the things that I'm telling you, and they couldn't argue against that because he's quoting their people. And they couldn't say, well, we disagree with that. Paul says, your own poets say that. Now, I wish I could say that that idea was mine, but I stole that idea from Paul. That's what he's doing. How are they going to argue against him? They can't brilliant what he does. Paul was obviously well read, obviously well versed in some of these poets and some of these secular authors, and so he pulls sources of authority that they would recognize, poems that they would recognize, and he's saying, here's the truth as stated by your own pagan poets, but they ascribe it to Zeus. These things do not belong to Zeus. These things belong to the one true God, and you're responsible to seek after him. Now, when Paul says we're all his children or we're all his offspring, I don't want you to think for one moment that Paul's going soft on them and saying, look, we're all God's children. No matter what you believe or what you've done, let's just all wrap our arms around each other and hugs and kisses for everybody. We're all going to be with God in the end because we're all his children. That's not what he's saying. He's speaking in a creative sense. We are all his offspring because he is the creator of the world and everything in it. To a Christian audience, Paul would say the same thing this way. He would say, we are created in the image of God, and we bear His image, even though marred by sin. We are His offspring, Paul says. In other words, we share some of the attributes of the nature of God, some of those personable attributes and relationship attributes. We are image bearers of God. And so if my nature cannot be contained in wood or stone or gold or jewels or something fashioned by the art and the thought of man, then neither can the divine nature. And that's what he says in verse 29. And this is where we, Paul comes to their rejection of God. Not only are they responsible to God, but verse 29, they have rejected God. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think 
that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and the thought of man. Insane, isn't it, that somebody should fashion an idol, cover it with metal, set it up on a shelf, and then bow down to it. Oh, my idol tottered. Just a second. Prop up the idol, put a little piece of paper underneath the one edge or a little folded piece of cardboard to keep your idol up straight. And then to bow down and to worship that. Isaiah pokes fun, or God actually in the book of Isaiah pokes fun at the idols. Isaiah chapter 44. The Lord says, or Isaiah says, you want to create an idol, so you go out and you plant a tree. A fir tree, and it grows up into be a big, nice tree. And the rain comes in and it waters the tree, and the tree grows up, and it gets the size that you want, and so then you go out and you cut down that tree. And you're cold and you're hungry, and so you take half of that tree and you cut it up into firewood, and you stack it up and you go in and you start a fire to warm yourself next to the fire. And you're hungry, and so you roast a roast over the fire, and then you eat the roast and you say, I'm filled, and you warm yourself next to the fire and you say, I'm warm. And then you take the other half of that same tree and you carve it and fashion it into an idol and you set it up and say, Thou art my God, deliver me. Is that not the height of insanity? By definition, anything you create is less than you. But men will actually create something in their mind and in their heart and by their hands and bow down and give homage to that thing as if that was the thing that created them. Insanity. But men, rather than seeking after God, men will fashion in their heart and in their mind and by their hands anything other than to worship the one true living God as He is revealed in the pages of Scripture. What kind of insanity has to be present to bow down and worship anything other than God as He is presented to us in Scripture? And yet, my friends, that it is exactly what people all over this world do, that is exactly what Christians all over this country do, and I fear it is exactly what some of you do. Verse 29 brings us right back to where we started. What comes into your mind when you think about God? How do you think of Him? Are your thoughts about Him and your concepts about Him worthy of Him? Or are they far below Him? C.H. Spurgeon said this, If you love anything better than God, you are idolaters. If there is anything you would not give up for God, it is your idol. If there is anything that you seek with greater fervor than you seek the glory of God, that is your idol. And conversion means turning from every idol. Spurgeon again said, This is the one easily besetting sin of our nature, to turn aside from the living God and to make unto ourselves idols in some fashion or another. For the essence of idolatry is this, to love anything better than God, to trust anything more than God, or to wish we have a God other than the one we have, or to have some signs and wonders by which we may see Him, some outward symbol or manifestation that can be seen with the eye or heard with the ear, rather than to rest in an invisible God and believe the faithful promises of Him whom eye hath not seen nor ear heard. Anything we put before God becomes our idol. But so is anything that we think about God that is not true of Him. That becomes an idol. And an idol of the hand is just as offensive as an idol of the mind. Because we may not bow down to something and worship it, but we may fashion in our minds a God that is much like us, and Him we worship, and we do this all the time. You want an example? The doctrine of hell. You know what the objection is to the doctrine of hell? I can't believe that the doctrine of hell and eternal punishment is true because that wouldn't be loving. And the implied assumption is God wouldn't do anything that I deem to be unloving. And so if it's unloving to me, it must not be true of God. And so we measure Him by our own yardstick and we fashion a God that is just like us. John Calvin said this, Indeed, vanity joined with pride can be detected in the fact that in seeking God, miserable men do not rise above themselves as they should, but they measure Him by the yardstick of their own carnal stupidity and neglect sound investigation. And thus, out of curiosity, they fly off into empty speculations. They do not apprehend God as He offers Himself, but they imagine Him as they have fashioned Him in their own presumption. I want a God that fits my definition of love, 
my definition of justice, my definition of fairness, my definition of equality. I want a God who's just like me. Have you ever paused to consider just how much like you the God you worship is? You ever pause to consider that? What sport does your God like? Of course, the one you like. What team does your God root for? Obviously not the team that I root for. Because they're not doing too good. How does God want to be worshipped? You know what the answer to that question invariably is? My God wants to be worshipped exactly as I enjoy worshipping Him. And the question is never asked, how does God say He wants to be worshipped? If God wanted to be worshipped by us coming here every week and cutting holes in the palms of our hands, it would be our responsibility to worship Him that way. But you know how we worship Him in North America? However we're comfortable worshipping Him? whatever we feel good about, whatever makes us feel good, that's exactly how our God wants to be worshipped. The question we never ask is, how has God said He is to be worshipped? Another example? Election. What's the objection to the biblical doctrine of election? That's not fair. And so we take the yardstick of our own carnal stupidity, the yardstick of our own fairness, we put God up against it, and we put Him in this little box, and we say, well, God's not allowed to do anything that I would want Him to do or that I don't think is fair, or that I don't think is just, or that I don't think is right. Friends, what comes into your mind when you think about God? John Calvin said, We do not apprehend God as He has given Himself to us. Rather, we fashion Him in our mind in a way that makes us comfortable, that doesn't offend us. And most of us have clay gods that are much like us, measured by our standard of fairness, measured by our standard of justice, Shaped to be just like us. And so I ask you, have you taken all the rough edges off of your deity? Do you have them in your little boxes where you can control them and manage them and everything functions just like you want it to function? You have no problem explaining anything mysterious. Friends, we do not come to God on our terms. We come to God on His terms. And He offers us to, He offers Himself to us in Scripture on His terms. And we must come before Him and accept Him that way mystery and all. And yes, there are elements about God which are offensive to us. There are things about God that are scary to us. There are things about God that are mysterious to us that we cannot explain. But we must accept Him as He offers Himself, whether we can explain it, like it, or love it, or not. Because that is who He is. What comes into your mind when you think about God? May God deliver us from wrong thoughts about Him, which constitutes idolatry. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for who You are. We thank You for the revelation of Your Word. If we didn't have Your Word, Father, we would fashion after after our own speculations and vain thoughts, idols and images and carvings, and we would bow down and worship them. We would be lost in superstition. We would be running as far and fast from You as we possibly could. And yet you have rescued us from sin and you have revealed yourselves to us, yourself to us in the pages of scripture. And we ask God that you would convict us and give us the grace to accept you on your terms, to love you as you present yourself to us and not to try and minimize who you are. Deliver us from wrong thoughts about you and help us by your grace to think only those thoughts that are worthy of you, that we might worship you as you are and not as we want you to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting kootenaichurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.